Jesus died on the cross for us. And you might feel a little bit sad to think about how Jesus died on the cross. He was made fun of. He was hurt. And it's kind of sad to think about that. You might even ask yourself, why did Jesus have to die? Couldn't God have just decided to do something different? I mean, Jesus is the king. Why would he let people be mean to him? Well, I'm going to show you why Jesus had to die on the cross with a little illustration. You see, the water in this picture represents our hearts. God created the very first people, Adam and Eve, with clean hearts, just like this clean water. But as you know, Adam and Eve and all of us have sinned or disobeyed God. And because of that sin, our hearts are now dirty. With sinful hearts, we can't be close to God anymore. That means that we can't be his close friend, and one day we won't even be with him in heaven because of this sin. But Jesus cares about us, and he wanted us to be close to him and the Father. So Jesus decided to take on the punishment that we all deserve for sinning. That is death. Even though Jesus had never sinned, he died in our place, and he took on the sins that we deserved, or that we had committed. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And Jesus took on our sin. He provided healing for our hearts. This is Jesus' healing. Because of what Jesus did on the cross, our hearts can be made clean. As you see this water, it is not red anymore. It is turning completely clear again, just like it was in the beginning. That's what Jesus can do for you and for me. All we have to do to receive a clean heart like this is to say, yes, Jesus, I believe that you are the Lord, God's son, who died on the cross to take on my sins and that you rose again three days later. Lord, please forgive me and wash me clean. And as you ask Jesus to do that, he will always say yes. The Bible says that if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And once you're saved, you have a clean heart forever. That's what Jesus did on the cross. And that's why he had to die. So that we could be made clean and be a friend of God again. Let's remember that today as we remember Jesus' death. And let's thank him for all that he did to make us clean. Will you pray with me? Let's bow our heads. Dear Jesus, thank you for all that you did on the cross. Thank you for coming, for laying down your life for us so that we could be made clean. Jesus, we praise you and thank you for all of those hard things that you had to go through many years ago. Because through that, we have been made a friend of you again. Jesus, if nobody, if someone here has not asked you to make their heart clean, I pray that they will do that today. And for those of us who have been made clean, I pray that we will thank you for all that you've done for us. Amen. Bye, boys and girls. Hello, and thank you for joining us for the special online Good Friday service. This is a day that we remember, and it has a somber tone as we look back to and think about the crucifixion 
death and torture of Jesus Christ. And in that, I think it's necessary to ask ourselves, who is Jesus? And I don't mean this as some sort of obvious, uh, ludicrous question with a Sunday school kind of answer. I mean, seriously, think about it. Who was Jesus? Jesus was someone who was born in very humble circumstances. Like all children, it was not his choice on how or when he entered the world. His human father and his mother cared deeply for him before he was born. And even unto those initial moments, they became a mother and father. They cared for him deeply as a baby, as a toddler, as an adolescent, and as a young adult. They were there for him every step of the way. They encouraged him to learn his own father's craft of carpentry and even learn about all the different uh, customs and laws and, and, and cultural ideas and history. He grew up like most normal children would. He had a very um, similar teenage life than, than a lot of kids today would have, maybe, you know, without all the technology. But a lot of the same pressures, I imagine a lot of the same hormones, and a lot of the same stresses of finding yourself as you get older, and finding that place, realizing the mission that God has for you. You might be saying to yourself, you know, Jesus was God. Okay, we get that. He probably knew the laws and the cultures. He probably understood all that. You know, it, there wasn't, you know, it may not have been necessary for Jesus to quote unquote learn those things. He probably got all of it. But we need to remember that Jesus did grow. Scripture speaks how Jesus grew. And we also need to remember that in all the moments of anybody's life, once humanity is most evident in two places, and that's in one's birth and also in one's death. I think that this day that we are celebrating this day that, that we are remembering is not completely about the humanity of Christ, nor completely about the divinity of Christ. I think, I think that it is also about Christ's relationship with humanity. For us to understand the weight and importance of this day, it's important for us to cling to and understand the human nature of Christ. But what does that human nature point to? What is that human nature's responsibility? How is it fleshed out, so to speak, within the mission of God? As we talked about this past Wednesday during our midweek devotional, Jesus likely got tired. He was on the go all the time, and especially moving into his final week, he did not let up in his ministry. He faced it head on. Now, did he, did he feel the weight of what was happening to him? Did he cry out to God and show real and raw emotion? Yes, absolutely. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 27, verse 45 to verse 61 says this. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness all over the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders, hearing it said, this man is calling Elijah. And some of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But others said, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come and to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, 
The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. The tombs were also opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, Truly, Truly, this was the Son of God. There were also many women there, looking on from a distance, who had followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mother, the, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, Mary, Mary, the mother of James, excuse me, and Joseph, the mother of the sons of Zebedee. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea, named Joseph, who was also a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus, but then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. And Joseph took that body and wrapped it in a clean linen shroud and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had cut into the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there, sitting opposite the tomb. Death is not pleasant. When it happens around us, we realize that it is part of being human that causes us to look back and reflect on who we hope we are, who we, who we hope we have been, the legacy we hope we have left. Death causes us to reflect on what we stand for and also causes us to think about what is most important. For Jesus, what was most important to him was the mission of God at work in the world. His life and his ministry was a central part of God's redemptive mission in the world. During his ministry, while he walked the earth, people were healed. People were given hope. People were given joy, love, promise, and belonging. Some were released from the very things that held them in bondage away from knowing God. Jesus knew that his mission would only be complete, that God's mission would only be real and effective if a necessary action took place. There is no way for humanity to intimately know God again without payment for the sins of humankind. There was no animal sacrifice or food offering that was good enough to permanently cover the payment for sin. Only one thing was God's perfect son who was blameless who listened and obeyed his parents well, who showed people compassion and grace, who taught many about the blessings of God, who healed and who changed lives. The life of Jesus was one that, in today's lifespan, many people would say it was short, but it was one that mattered. And it was in his life and his death that the very course of human history would change. Just as the life of Christ in this world ended, the seemingly endless cycle that began with Adam and Eve, God blessing Adam and Eve with a magnificent paradise, and then them messing up, and then God finding a way to bless and come to humanity and maybe even show them a path to redemption and blessing again. But then humanity would mess up again. And over and over and over all throughout the books of the Old Testament. As we see in Joshua, even when God's people come into the promised land and onward and forward through Judges and into 1 Samuel, even the first king of Israel, Saul, thought that his ways became better than God's at one point. God sent Jesus to end that cycle. He knew that no, no purely human person would ever be able to cover the price and payment for sin and bring humanity back to an intimate relationship with God once again. It is through that belief that we have in Jesus that we are able to know God personally, deeply, and intimately. Endings are not always pleasant, especially when it refers to one's death. 
that in this case, this ending is not just an end. It is not just the end of the life of Christ, walking the earth and doing ministry in human form. It is not just a time to look back and to reflect fondly on the stories of Christ as we see in the parables, you know, as we read about around Christmas time. This ending, the ending of the life of Christ in this world, is all about a new beginning. It is all about a Savior. And it's all about a promise coming to fulfillment. This ending is about a new promise. This ending points to something much, much greater than death. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for this time that we've had to reflect on the ultimate sacrifice that your son Jesus Christ paid. God, I pray that those thoughts, I pray that those ideas um, that have been spoken today would not fall void, but I pray that they would push us onward and forward that they would push us deeper into knowing you, Lord, and a desire to want to make you known. Death is not fun to think about. It is a very sad thing to consider. But God, I pray that you are glorified. I pray that you are glorified above all, in all, and through all. This weekend, this day, as we remember our Lord and Savior Jesus, as we remember and reflect on the cross. It is in your Son's name we pray. Amen. of a God and King Lift up your voice and bear the sing Oh, praise Him Hallelujah Over inside with golden gleam Thou silver mill with softer so strong He clouds that sail and held along Oh, oh praise Him Hallelujah Now rise in mood and praise rejoice He lights a lead me find a voice Hallelujah.